Okay, great. So our first speaker is the Director of Technology at Darktrace, which is one of the, the leading market leading firms in the space of cyber defense. He goes by the name of Dave Palmer. I'm going to ask him to come, come up on the stage. Dave. How are you? Thank you? Very much. Before you joined Darktrace, you worked at GCHQ, didn't you? That's right, and MI5, yes. MI5. Those are sort of spy agencies. They are. So the name isn't Dave, is it? Well, the, uh, there's an old joke that if you've got a common name, a short online history, and you're inappropriately wearing a tie, then you may well be a spy, absolutely. If they're not wearing a tie, they might be a serial killer that's just got a, out of prison. So. Well, we will find out now, <laughs> Dave. Thanks for making the time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for excusing my notes just to keep me on time. Um, so we've been hearing over the last couple of days greatly that um, it's no surprise that AI is absolutely going to change the, the future of the internet. But this session is really to talk about what's behind some of these headlines and what's realistic and likely to come out of digital criminals uh, using AI to change the way that their, their business models work. This can be a slightly depressing presentation. Um, and so if you miss the morning sessions about how AI is going to make a lot of improvements to cybersecurity, then uh, I'm sorry about that. There's no good news here. All the good news was this morning. But sometimes when we read the newspapers and we see headlines like the ones just now, it feels like we don't ever make any progress on cybersecurity. There's always something going wrong. But the reality is, aside from the occasional critical but short-lived vulnerability, just being able to hack your way through a business's firewalls and, and cause harm is, is relatively unusual, pretty rare, something that rarely even happens in the movies anymore. So we must be making some progress as a global community. And it's true today, and I think it will remain true in the future, that the easiest way to get inside of businesses is not some technical wizardry hacking your way through firewalls, but tricking someone or behaving like an imposter and getting someone to do something that's not in their best interests. And even super-hardened data centers, nuclear power stations, and cloud services still need to be accessed and administered by people. So we're ripe for lots of people that could be tricked. Now, many of us would feel like we recognize what getting tricked looks like. We see emails like this one. This is a real malicious email sent to me. Um, I'm a bit of a stickler for professional grammar and formatting, so this didn't really float my boat. Uh, a machine has decided this is spam, put some meaningless numbers in a title, and showed it to me anyway. Uh, but the, you know, the overwhelming thing here is, if you're looking for love with me, please don't send it to multiple recipients at once. Uh, it's somewhat rude. So I didn't cl click on this attachment, and I'm sure none of you would either. But this is also a genuine malicious email sent to me, and it's from someone who exists, who I know. We'd never digitally communicated about this topic in the past, but the previous lunchtime, we'd walked from the front door of our offices to a nearby um, unbranded coffee shop uh, to get lunch, and we discussed this while we walked along. And the following day, I received this email, which is a perfect reflection of what we talked about. Now, that is super creepy. Almost certainly, someone was hanging around outside of our offices with photos of people that worked at the company, and a group of us got similarly focused emails the following day. But I was very lucky. There are some errors here. There are some errors in the signature. The way that avenue is spelt in the signature is not the way you'd spell it if you were um, um, uh, British, like Matt is. Um, but the real reason I knew this wasn't from Matt is it's just too polite. <laughs> this is not how Matt sends emails. And the idea that there's a smiley face in there is, is not like him at all. So I didn't click on, on this attachment either, but only because I was exceedingly lucky at the time. And in the cybersecurity world, this is called spear phishing. And what worries me more than most in, the, in our AI future is what spear phishing is going to be like when AI is used to speed up uh, uh, the attacks and reduce the number of resources involved. To give you an example of this, imagine a piece of malicious software on any of your laptops. And imagine it can read your email, your WhatsApp, your Slack, your GitHub commits, whatever you type and however you communicate with others. Now imagine it trains itself on how you differently communicate with the different people in your life. 
how you talk to your boss may be different to how you talk to your partner, with friends and colleagues, and different again with customers. Once it can understand how you communicate with those different people, and it understands the context of what you're talking about because you've emailed about it or it's in your calendar, then it will be very easy indeed to replicate the communications that you have with them. Maybe you and I have been communicating and we've agreed to meet somewhere and you, not you, your laptop sends me an email that says, um, Dave, let's meet here um, uh, on Tuesday and here's a map uh, to where we're going to meet. And in that map is a malicious payload. Or if we've been editing a document backwards and forwards, one more tiny edit, add a malicious payload and send it back to me. Will I open those emails? I'm definitely going to open those emails because they're going to be contextually relevant and they're going to sound like they're from you. And it doesn't matter what our relationship is like, that, that can be replicated. And from a technical perspective, this is going to come from your real laptop via your real accounts, your real mail infrastructure, and into all of the correct things for, for me as well. I'm not really sure how we think about blocking that until we've got some sort of antivirus that recognizes how you communicate with me normally. And the reason why this will be interesting to criminals is it's very low resource intensive and it could explode across supply chains. If you want to go after a particular part of a bank or you even more likely initially, I think, you want to go after a specific celebrity, then start on the edge of their social graph and work your way in. And it might feel like it might be far away, but I think it's reasonably imminent as an idea and I'll show you why. One of the companies that's been here for the last couple of days is X.AI, a company that can use AI to help you schedule things. And this, this example, uh, this is how it works. Uh, Mary's emailed Greg and said, can we meet for coffee? Greg messages back and copies in the AI assistant uh, and gives it some instructions. The AI assistant understands the natural language processing, understands his calendar, understands when he's going to be in the office and when he's free, and offers up some time slots. Mary says, I can't make some of those. The bot continues to understand and says, I'll send out a meeting request. Really, how much more context do we need than this in order to be able to create that spear phishing bot? The only thing we need to do is replicate communicational style. And if you've been exposed in any way to Twitter bots or other um, bots on Facebook that are increasingly good at seemingly influencing elections, then you'll know that this is um, something that also exists in the world. Do you need three PhDs to pull this off? Well, the X.AI guys are very clever, but this is an offline attack. You don't need to respond in real time. You can really think about it. So I suspect you know, a typical second year course in NLP from Stanford would give you all the tools you need. And these days, you don't get, need to get into the universities anymore. You can just simply do them online from your sofa. So this is, I think, relatively imminent. And it makes a lot of sense from a business process perspective. Now, what else will AI be used for by digital criminals? Well, time and again, we discuss the idea of ambient surveillance and uh, microphones in our, uh, in our daily lives. And it usually centers on the kitchen. And, you know, as a society, we've kind of shrugged that off. You know, if Google can hear what I'm saying in my kitchen, I don't really care. They're probably not evil. Uh, and then we hear stories that the CIA are actively hacking smart TVs, and many of them have uh, undocumented microphones or cameras. But if I, I kind of think if the CIA wants to see me in my pyjamas watching Great British Bake Off, I still don't care. Um, what are they going to do with that information? But genuinely, I think in our organizations and businesses, the risk balance starts to change, particularly because IoT is typically the easiest things to attack in your business. Many video conferencing units have things like hard-coded passwords or just poor security generally. And we've already worked with law firms here in London where the video conferencing units are hacked and the meetings are live streamed out to unknown criminals that will never be found on the internet. Could you make money from that? I think absolutely you could. You can um, maybe find out about undisclosed M&A. You could um, sell secrets to plaintiffs or potentially extort people that have revealed secrets that they didn't realize you were listening to. So I think you can make money from it, and it's a reasonably good criminal activity to consider. But the thing is, I don't think criminals want to go to more meetings. I think if you want to do widespread harm to a large number of people and you like meetings, you'll probably join the British government. So we need AI here as well. Why sit and listen to the meeting? We can stream it to Google or Microsoft or Alibaba or 
um, Amazon, and they will convert all of that speech into text for us. We don't even have to think about it. We just make sure we've got a credit card attached to the account, ideally a stolen one, not your actual one. Once you've got the text, convert, uh, once you've converted the, the discussions into text, then you could search through them manually for things that you're interested in, but again, create an AI model of the things that you're semantically and contextually interested in and have it go look for you. If you're really lazy, you can get it to self colorate and see if the M&A that's being discussed has already been declared or not. So all you're picking up is the golden nuggets. And frankly, you could start hammering IoT left, right, and center. You can launch indiscriminate campaigns all over the world because it doesn't cost you anything apart from the, the few, dollars on, uh, few cents in a dollar that you'll need for um, processing it in the cloud. In more targeted situations, if you want to be a bit more sneaky, you could even have a local software agent just make sure the right board member's face is present or VIP in the meeting room. Tag it as extra interesting if there are animated emotions in the, in the room. Again, you don't have to write this. You don't have to be an AI wizard. Just take what we're uh, building for, for good and for positive reasons in our economy and start abusing them. So I think this, although ambient surveillance has been the stuff of spies and science fiction I th and has been absolutely neglected by criminals at scale, I think it will come back at scale because it's going to be cheap and easy to do. And frankly, ha hacking this sort of stuff rather than trying to hack your iPhone or your Windows 10 laptop is far easier and easy to scale. What else will change? Well, Smart software, I think, will also enable a much more subtle class of attacks. And this is at the more sophisticated and targeted end of the spectrum, and I think it will take a little while to get here. Anyone that works in cybersecurity that works with oil and gas firms r relatively rapidly finds out that they're worried about someone turning off an oil rig. But if it was me and I wanted to harm an oil and gas firm, I wouldn't create a visible crisis. You turn off one of these things and people will notice pretty quickly, and there's generally manual overrides in safety-critical systems. Instead, what I would do would be to change the underlying geophysical data that decided where and how much they would build, bid for different drilling and mining rights in different regions. And if you can trick them into bidding in the wrong place, then brilliant, their oil wells will come up dry, they've spent a lot of money, and it's not very easy to recover from. But if you do that a couple of times, probably someone's going to get a bit suspicious, and frankly, breaking into something like the big Microsoft Azure data center is relatively hard work. So if we're worried about getting caught, I think we don't start in the center of where all the data is, we start on the edge. Now these things are absolutely amazing. They typically uh, fly or swim, whatever the right adjective is, in swarms, hundreds of these submarines. Often they look like little spitfires. And not only do they not crash into each other when towed in their hundreds by boats, they come up with absolutely amazing pictures of the undersea world that's all joined together. And the amount of advanced mathematics that goes into all of that, not least of which not crashing into each other in a 3D space, is absolutely brilliant. But despite how clever they are, I absolutely guarantee to you they are not running antivirus on here. And they certainly haven't had the global security community focused on hardening. If you want to attack these things, I think it's relatively easy. At the end of every day, sailors go back to the port, they leave these things on the boats, and they go off and do sailor things, uh, whatever those sailor things are in ports these days. They're not under armed guard like your Amazon data center. So I would go after these things. Why does it need AI? Well, if you want contextual, long-term, near real-time data processing and modification, I don't think you're going to be able to pull that off with linear programming. I think you're going to want something more advanced and statistical to pull it off. Now, putting all these things together, we have a great, relatively truncated roadmap for um, criminal, uh, criminal gangs. And things are looking pretty sweet for hackers with mathematical textbooks. So they've got all of these choices as we've been through, and frankly, I've got a lot of other ideas as well. So if there's any investors in the room who want to go after a high-growth business, I've got some ideas. Catch me away from the cameras. But the main thing that I want to get across is there is a lot of belief and optimism that we're coming to the end of cybersecurity, and AI will let us catapult ourselves forwards and not have to worry about what criminals are doing in future. And really what I want to get across to you is there are just as many opportunities for the criminals and the digital arms race continues. With that, thank you very much.